called answering the call and we will still be here for some time but more on that a bit later on Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 uh, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says for we are God's masterpiece he has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things that he has planned for us long ago right so God has a call on each and every one of our lives he has a purpose a will a plan that he has uh, made for us even beforehand even before we were born uh, he had already this in mind right you're not just here on earth to study or to play mouse hunt or to listen to BTS you're here on earth to fulfill the will and purpose and the call of God on your life so as we are making our way through this series what we're doing is that we're looking at the different elements in answering God's call on our lives and we're looking at the lessons that we can pull out of from the call of Abraham and paralleling that with our own experiences so week one week one we saw that answering the call is your call right if God calls you to do something it is your responsibility to then get it done God will empower you he will help you but he's not going to do it for you and so you cannot be passive about answering God's call neither can you expect other people to fulfill God's call for you occasionally sometimes people will come to me and they'll be really excited and then uh, they're really excited because they feel like God has spoken to them and then they'll come and then they'll say I feel that God told me that we need to do this so how are we going to do that and I will say, it's not we, it's you, right? If God told you to do something, it's your call, not us. And so you have to figure out what God has called you to do and how you're going to do it. We're here to give you advice, we're here to help you with what you need, but God's call on your life is your call, right? You're primarily responsible for it. We too, we saw that answering the call requires paying a price. Right? So doing what God wants sometimes means that you have to give up what we want. There is a cost to following Jesus, and Jesus said so himself. He said that if any man would be my disciple, he must pick up his cross and then follow me. Right? So there's a price that we sometimes have to pay. Sometimes that price comes in terms of our environment, and we have to make some changes to our lifestyle or the culture that we have. Uh, sometimes that change is in the area of our relationships and we need to change who we relate with and who we uh, have an intimate relationship with on, on a deeper level. Sometimes that price comes in terms of our identity and we have to let go of who we are so that God can then remake us into who He wants us to be. So just like Jacob had to let go of Jacob so that God could remake him into Israel, we sometimes need to do the same. Adele has to die so that God can remake Adele into something better. So there is a price. There is a price that needs to be paid. But if you love Jesus, what you gain in paying the price really will be so much more. That brings us back to last week. Last week, answering the call means living in mystery. How many of you learned something last week? Something enlightening. You feel a bit less confused about living in the mysteries of God's call. Yeah. Or are you more confused? No. no. Right, if you're more confused, you can go find Eric. You can have a support group with Eric because he has had a lot of previous assumptions challenged recently <laughs> and so he's kind of going through like the grieving process and <laughs> step one is uh, denial and so that's where he is at right now <laughs> denying the fact that his assumptions have to die <laughs> okay Genesis chapter 12 verse 1 the Lord said to Abram Go out from your land, your relatives and your father's house to the land that I will show you. So we're looking at the fact that God called Abraham. But when God called Abraham, He did not tell Abraham where to go. He did not tell Abraham when he should leave. He did not tell Abraham how to get there. He did not tell Abraham what to do when he gets there. Right? All God said to Abraham was, 
go to the land that I will show you. And rather than tell Abraham how everything is going to play out and how everything is going to happen right from the beginning, God keeps a certain level of mystery to the whole plan, to the whole call that God has for Abraham, right? So there's a certain level of unknown. There is a certain level of mystery there. All that God gave Abraham was the general direction. The land. That's it. The land. That's the general direction. And then he expected Abraham to then be wise about his decisions, to make choices, to trust and obey God, to learn how to discern and navigate the mysteries of God's will as he then steps into this unknown path. And that's typically what happens when you try to answer God's call for your life. It's not always as clear as you want it to be. Now we don't have time to recap all that. Uh, if you want to recap, you can re-watch the video, it's on YouTube. But to summarize the premise for this message, is that God has a call on our lives. The call is often mysterious to us. Within the mysteries, there are many different choices that we can make. We have the freedom to make those choices, but not all the choices are equal. Some has rewards, some has consequences. So that brings us then to the big question, how do you then navigate the call of God for your life? How do you figure out which of these choices are within the will of God for you? And which of them are outside of the will of God? Just because you have choices does not mean that God will not guide you. Right? You're not left alone to figure all this out for yourself. I know sometimes it seems like God gives you a cryptic message and you kind of wonder what's going on. But trust me, the intention of God is never to say, okay, you have this cryptic message, now bye-bye, good luck, figure it out by yourself, all the best, I'll see you on the other side if you make it. <laughs> God's not like that. That's not the case at all. And when you look at God's Word, you see that there are in fact many different methods in which God uses to guide His people through the mystery of the call. Now, God's guidance might not come in the form or the way that you expect. And even then, you are still ultimately responsible to discern and follow His leading. But nonetheless, God will guide you, He will lead you through, He will be with you. And that's really the bulk of what we are looking at as we cover this third point in answering the mystery or answering the call of God, the mysteries of God's call. What we're doing is that we're looking at the various ways which God leads us as we follow Him. Uh, I was briefly talking to Wilson and Shireen this week. I was discussing with them uh, this particular message. I was telling them about the different ways that I see in the Bible that God is leading his people and they were reflecting on what I said and they were thinking back on their own lives and they found it to be true that God does lead us in these ways uh, in our lives and in uh, even their own ministry. Shereen was saying that oh I think the, the most prominent way that God leads me is through providence right and she thinks that's the way that God leads her the most. Uh, Wilson thinks that God leads him the most true wisdom and common sense. And we will, we'll cover that next week, that that is a legitimate way that God leads us also. Right? And so they were discussing the ways that they feel that God leads them the most. And then Shereen made an interesting observation. She said that, uh, I think that the way that God leads us differs from individual to individual. And it seems that He leads me more a certain way and He leads Wilson more a certain way. And that's a really good observation because God is a personal God, right? He knows you and He leads you the way you need to be led, right? And so it's not going to be the same for everyone. There are many different methods that God will use and it's all valid ways. We don't have a problem with God leading a person a certain way. I will have a problem if that person then claims that the way that God leads them is the only way or the superior way and it's that way or no other way. That is kind of wrong, that's kind of immature and kind of arrogant. Because God leads us 
the way that he thinks we need to be led. And it's going to be personal and there are many different ways as we will see. Now, some ways that God leads us are more clear than other ways. So there are checks and balances to all these different methods. But we'll see that there are in fact various ways that God guides us. We have to acknowledge all the different ways that we are led by God. And we have to say that all these ways are possible ways in which God can then use to lead us. And we should be open to them as well. So last week we took a look at two of the most basic ways, right? We took a look at the fact that uh, our decision needs to be according to God's word. And God's word is the primary way that God speaks to us, it's the primary way that He leads us and guides us. And if God's word has already clearly stated something that we should not do, then we should not do those things. We should not give God our leftovers. We should not cause harm to someone else. We should not marry unbelievers. We should not abuse, use, or manipulate people to get ahead. All those things are what God's Word says we should not do. God's Word is also instructive to us on the things that we should do. We should put God at the center of our lives. We should forgive and not judge other people. You should share your super preachings with me. Right? All those are God's will. So you don't have to pray when it comes to those things. You don't have to wait for a voice from heaven. God has already written them down for you so that you know what to do. And when God's word has clearly said something that needs to be done or not done, then it just comes down to a matter of obedience, whether you will follow or not, because it's already clearly said. Now, the second principle is, is my decision Christ-like? WWJD, right? Just make sure your Jesus is not the imaginary Jesus. It's the real Jesus. So another way that we can discern God's will is to see that if the decisions that we make will be a choice that Jesus would then also make if he were in our situation. So we have to ask ourselves, does it go against the mind of Jesus? Uh, does it uh, go with the heart of Jesus? Does it match up to Jesus' personality if I make these choices? And chances are, if something matches up to the mind and the heart and the personality of Jesus, then it's probably within the will of God for you. And you should feel free to make those choices. Right, so those are the two criteria. They are the most basic, they are the most foundational, most fundamental things in navigating the mysteries of God's call. And I have to say that they supersede all the other methods. If you're about to make a choice which violates the word of God, or goes against the character of Christ. It is absolutely wrong even if you have a dream about it. Even if a prophet gave you a word about it. Even if an angel visited you and gave you a message about it. Even if somebody in BTS told you to do it. It will still be wrong if it goes against the word of God, if it goes against the character of Christ. So you always have to keep these two considerations in mind really for your own sake because it is a safeguard for you so that you don't make a mistake that you will regret later on. Okay, our recap is done. Today, we are going to add on more considerations to navigating God's call. Uh, we are going to start to move in the more personal and more subjective considerations that can be made. But before we go into that proper, I know it's getting old by now, but I tell you that we're not going to finish the rest of the fall that I said that we were going to finish. I don't know what it is with this message. It's just not going to happen. It just keeps growing. We will cover one of the remaining four considerations today. And then I'm not going to guess when we'll finish the rest. But let's finish one consideration for today. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 to 13. Paul writes, to the Philippians and he says, Dear friends, you always follow my instructions when I was with you, and now that I am away, it is even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. The third principle we must consider in navigating the mysteries of God's call is, is my decision fueled by God's conviction. See, when you believe in Jesus, Holy Spirit then came into your life, came to dwell with you, and now He's working in your life to create a new mind, a new heart, new passion, new desires, new power, new will, a 
new inner voice. I'm going to take all those things that he does that is new in you and sum it all up and just call them the convictions that he gives you, the com godly convictions. And so now you have to reason, right? If the Holy Spirit is the one creating all these new things, new convictions in me, then it's pretty safe to say that if I follow these inner convictions, it is within the will of God for my life. Otherwise, why would the Holy Spirit create those convictions in you? It has to have, it has to be within God's will. It has to be within the plan and call of God for your life that He put that certain desire there. That He put that certain passion or that burden over there. So the Holy Spirit then creates a new desire in your heart to want to go to church, to be serious about going to church. And you say to yourself, you know, I'm going to go to church every single week so that I can know God more and I want to faithfully come to church. And that's obviously God directing you. If the Holy Spirit puts a desire for you to be more intentional about telling someone about Jesus and you go to your workplace or you go to your school and you think to yourself, wow, Bob really needs Jesus. And now, you have, now you're trying to find a way to be intentional about sharing Christ with them. Then that's also God leading you. If you feel a desire to pick up a new skill and you find yourself saying, I'm suddenly very interested in learning design or learning a new language or learning a new musical instrument, then go ahead and do that because you never know God might be preparing you for something that you need in the future by learning those things now. This is not some kind of new idea at all. In fact, it is very old because Christians through all the ages have always realized that one way that God leads us is from the inside of us true godly convictions. We read what Paul wrote in Philippians. He says that the Holy Spirit puts desires in our hearts. Uh, back in the 4th century, there was an early church father by the name of Augustine who said this. He said, love God and do what you want. Love God and do what you want. Really simple principle for life. Billy Graham in more recent history became an evangelist because he had an intense desire for the lost people of the world to be saved. It was simple as that, right? That desire was what led him to become an evangelist. So as you grow in your love for Christ, and the Holy Spirit is working in you to put in you all those godly convictions, then what God wants becomes what you want. And it's in that context that the psalmist writes in Psalm 37, he says, take delight in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. Because your heart's desires are the desires that God put inside. And if God put those desires inside of you, then it must have to do with the call of God for your life. And it has to do with the call of God for your life, then God definitely wants you to fulfill that call. And if He wants to fulfill, you to fulfill that call, then of course He's going to give it to you if you love and delight in Him. So you see how this works. Okay, let's look at some of the ways that God leads us from the inside of us. Uh, some of this might be old to you, but others might be new. First one, your conscience. Romans chapter 14, verse 1 to 2 and 14. Paul writes and he says, Accept other believers who are weak in the faith, and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. For instance, one person believes it's all right to eat anything, but another believer with a sensitive conscience will eat only vegetables for a person. I know and am convinced on the authority of the Lord Jesus that no food in and of itself is wrong to eat. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> but if anyone believes it is wrong, then for that person it is wrong. Okay? First Timothy chapter 1 verse 19. Think to your faith in Christ, keep your conscience clear. For some people have deliberately violated their consciences. As a result, their faith has been shipwrecked. So there is a correlation between how clear your conscience is and uh, the state of your faith. Acts chapter 24 verse 16. Because of this, I will always try to maintain a clear conscience before God and all people. And 
Hebrews chapter 13, verse 18, pray for us, for our conscience is clear, and we want to live honorably in everything that we do. Right? You never realize how much uh, something in the Bible is important until you do a study on it. And we see that one way that God guides us is really through our conscience. Right? God created you with a conscience. That's your inner sense of right and wrong. And even though it's not perfect, because the Bible tells us that you can break your conscience, you can remove it as a way that God leads you, God has still placed this moral compass inside of you to help you make the right decisions. So whatever choice or decision that you make, you have to make sure that your conscience is clear. And the Apostle Paul and other church leaders, they were pretty clear about how they lived their lives for Jesus. They wanted to live their lives for Jesus with a clear conscience. Right? They wanted to keep a clear conscience as a guiding principle for the choices that they made. And so should we. You should only do what your conscience allows you to do. That's a really helpful principle to keep in mind, especially when it comes to things that the Bible isn't so clear about. Now, if something isn't explicitly stated in God's word, don't do this or do this, then that's pretty clear, right? You just follow the word of God. But what if it's more subjective? What if it's like, is it a sin to eat chicken skin? <laughs> what if it's like, can I drink alcohol if I make sure that I don't get drunk? What about, is it okay for me to get a tattoo? What about, is it right to play a violent video game like PUBG where I'm blowing somebody's head off? What about, how many hours should I spend lying in my bed if I have a free day? Whole day. Yes. Whole day. <laughs> Those are decisions where your conscience can play a very big role. There are other considerations also. You have to think about other uh, factors. But one of the main ones is, does your conscience allow you to do those things? And if it doesn't, then don't. Because if it violates your conscience, then it's wrong for you. Right? It is, becomes sin for you. But it, do, it does not. Then that choice can be part of God's will for your life. One question that I get asked from time to time is with regards to yoga. Right? Can a Christian practice yoga? By the way, it's not just yoga, it's also other exercises like Muay Thai. Uh, yoga has to do or has its roots in Hinduism, Muay Thai has its roots in Buddhism. So there are other things like that also. It just happens to be that yoga is more popular next to Hollywood. <laughs> and so people will come to the question, is it okay for me to practice yoga? want to do it as an exercise, I heard it's pretty good, I think it will benefit me, so is it okay for a Christian to do it? And I would have this same approach. I would typically first answer by explaining the origins of yoga. And I would explain that each of these poses is actually a worship pose to some Hindu god. And I'll explain there is nothing wrong with exercising, there is nothing wrong with stretching. I advise them to avoid the religious aspects of it. And then, I let their conscience make their final decision. If, after they know everything, their conscience allows them to, because they know that they are doing this only for the exercise and the stretching and whatever, then so be it. They have the freedom to do it. But now, if they know all the facts and now their conscience says, no, I don't want to do that, then there's always Pilates. <laughs> And there's other kinds of stretching and exercises, many kinds, right? Sugar pop fitness or something. <laughs> you can always make some other choice. Or just don't exercise. Yes. Eat, be merry, grow fat and die. Yes. Right, so your conscience plays a big role in the way that God needs you. Your job is to make sure that whatever choice and decision that you make, if it does not violate God's will, that your conscience is also clear. And if it violates your conscience, then you should not be doing that because it is wrong for you. We go on to the second way that God leads us from the inside. Passions, burdens, and desires. I'm not tricking you. It's not three things. It's just one thing. <laughs> okay. okay, Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9. Uh, Jeremiah says, 
But if I say I will never mention the Lord or speak in His name, His word burns in my heart like fire. It's like a fire in my bones. I am worn out trying to hold it in. I can't do it. Uh, Luke chapter 24, verse 28 to 32. By this time, they were nearing Emmaus at the end of their journey. This is post-resurrection. Uh, Jesus acted as if he was going on, but they begged him, stay the night with us since it is getting late. These two people were on the, the, the road to uh, Emmaus, and Jesus was crucified some time ago, and they were wondering what was going to happen now because they thought he was the Messiah, but then he got crucified, and so now they are in distress, and they're not going... Not, they don't know what's going to happen and then Jesus appears on the road with them and he starts to reveal himself to them but he doesn't do it immediately he does it through a process okay <laughs> right so he's talking with them and then he's trying to explain things to them about uh, his, his crucifixion, crucifixion and they come to the point where it's night time and they can't pass Jesus to come in with them right because it's late so it says he went home with them. As they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. And then he broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And at that moment he disappeared. <laughs> and they said to each other, Didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? I don't know why that's the first thing that they said. They should have said, Did he just disappear? <laughs> <laughs> that would have been more pressing of a question, but never mind. They questioned him. They said, didn't our hearts burn within us? Uh, this language, burning in our heart, it's not referring to a heart that's on fire. It's heartburn. It's referring to heartburn either. It's a language, it's a, a way of saying passion, right? Did passion arise in us as Jesus explained scriptures to us? I feel so passionate about speaking God's word, I can't hold it in. That's what the prophet Jeremiah is saying. So that's passion. Romans chapter 11 verse 1. Paul writes to the Roman church and he says, For I want very much to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. Right? So meeting the Roman church, visiting the Roman church, Paul says is something that he wants to do. He didn't say it's what God told him to do. He says, I want to do this. I want to come to you. I want to meet you. I want to impart to you some spiritual gift. This is what I want to do. Then he will go on and say, Romans chapter 15, verse 20, My ambition has always been to preach the good news where the name of Christ has never been heard, rather than where a church has already been started by someone else. So it's Paul's ambition, his desire, his aim, his goal, to preach Jesus in places where the gospel had not yet reached. And that simple ambition guided his entire ministry and where he would go in his missionary journeys. It was his ambition. God didn't tell him to do that. It was what he wanted to do. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. Uh, we must each decide in our hearts how much to give and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure for God loves a person who gives cheerfully so even the decision on what to give in the church offering is an issue of personal desire what do you want to give? Right? how much do you want to give? you make the choice what has God put in your heart to give? all these verses demonstrate for us how God uses your desires He uses your passions He uses your burdens to lead you and guide you. I think the most famous example of this is Nehemiah. Uh, Nehemiah was an official to the Persian king while the Jews were in exile. And so while they were living in a foreign land, uh, while in exile and ha having this position as uh, the king's cupbearer, he receives news that the walls of Jerusalem were in ruin. And that news really put an immense burden in Nehemiah's heart to do something because it was disgraceful for city's walls to lie in ruins. And so he did do something about it. Right? God made a way for him to get permission and resources from the king so that he could then return back to Jerusalem and start the process of rebuilding the walls. And so for Nehemiah, what God laid in his heart, the burden that he felt, the desire that he had, was God's call for his life. 
Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 12 he wrote, wrote this in his journal he said I got up at night and took a few men with me after he reached Jerusalem but yet he says I did not tell anyone what my God had laid on my heart to do for Jerusalem at least not yet he didn't tell them but he's saying that God put this in my heart this intense burden that I felt this intense desire this ambition right it's laid in my heart from God one way that God leads you is through your passions, through your desires, through the burdens that you feel. Sometimes we get so paralyzed waiting for God. Right? We want God to give us a sign. We want God to give us a word. We want to receive a vision or a dream. We want an angel to visit us before we will do something. But perhaps all we really need to do is consider what's already in our heart to do. Especially when what's in your heart is for God and His kingdom. When you see a need that isn't being fulfilled, when you have a passion and a desire to do something for God that you see no one else doing, you have to pay attention to those convictions because they could be the way that God is leading you. And this has been one of the more consistent ways that God has led me through the years. I learned the guitar because I wanted to lead worship. That was my ambition. God didn't tell me anything about leading worship. I just wanted to do it. I built websites for the churches that I served in. Not because anybody told me, but because I saw a need. And I thought it would be really good for the church to have that. I investigated different topics in the Word of God because I was curious. And I had a desire to find out. And I wanted to know more. It's haunting me. And so I wanted to get those things answered for myself. I started meetings because I felt that they were necessary. Not all of them turned out the way I expected them to. Not all of them were as fruitful as I imagined them to be. But then again, God never promised huge success. What He requires for us is obedience and trust. And anyway, I still learned and benefit from all those experiences. So what's really important is obedience. And I think if you have any passion or desire or ambition that is ultimately God glorifying and does not contradict God's word or God's character, it's worth at least exploring. It's worth at least giving it a shot, trying it out. Anne is not running a cafe because God appeared to her and said, Thou shalt run a cafe. <laughs> right? That's not the way it happened at all. Uh, she was running a cafe because she saw a need. And the first time around, it was very obvious need. The church could not pay rent, and the offering was not enough to cover. And so, she has to run a cafe to make up the difference. It's kind of sad that the ministers of God have to work so that ministry can continue, but that's what it had came down to. This time around, uh, we still can't pay rent, and the offerings are still not enough to cover, and so we still have that. But she also sees the need for having a long-term system, long-term infrastructure, where min future ministries and future missionaries can be supported. And so we're building towards that but she's being guided by God through the need that she sees. And that might be one way that God is leading you also. What is the need that you see that no one else sees? What is the thing that you're passionate about that no one else shares? What is it that burns in your heart to do for God? Those are important questions. And when you find something like that, Pay attention to those things because that could be God's hand leading you into the call of God for your life to help you navigate the mysteries of God's will. So pay attention. Pay attention to your desires. Pay attention to your burdens. Pay attention to the things that you want to do. Passions. One final way that God leads us from the inside spiritual promptings. I know I talk a lot about the Word of God, but so you don't forget, I am Pentecostal in my orientation. I believe in the active presence, power, and gifts, and inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so spiritual promptings are a real thing for me. It's a real part of our Christian experience. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4 to 5 says, The Word of the Lord came to me. I chose you before I formed you in the womb. I set you apart before you were born. I appointed you a prophet to the nation. That's the call that came to Jeremiah to become a prophet for God. 
uh, and he says, the word of the Lord came to me. That means that's a voice of God, right? Uh, God speaking, probably true, an inner voice of the Holy Spirit to Jeremiah so that he will receive his call. Luke chapter 4 verse 1 says, Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River. He was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. The passage tells us that Jesus was led by the Spirit. In this case, there is no message that was delivered to Jesus to go into the wilderness. It was some kind of impression, some kind of feeling that he had to do this and go into the wilderness. Uh, John chapter 16, verse 13. When the, whole, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you in all truth. He will not speak on his own, but he will speak whatever he hears. He will also declare to you what is to come. That's what Jesus says of the Holy Spirit telling us that the Spirit will communicate with us, He will speak to us, He will make declarations, right? So He will speak to you. Acts chapter 2 verse 17, In the last days God says, I will pour out My Spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. So the Spirit also prompts us with dreams. He prompts us with visions. Acts chapter 8 Verse 26 to 29. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, oh, we'll get to angels sometime in the future as a method that God leads us, but for now we're not going to focus on that. The angel said, Go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Uh, so he started out, and on the way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasuries of the Kentucky, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home he was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The Spirit said to Philip, go to that chariot, stay near it. Right? So the Spirit then spoke to uh, Philip, telling him what to do. Go near that chariot, wait for the invitation of the eunuch to come aboard and explain the book of Isaiah to him. So there are really too many passages for me to put them all. I would have to put the entire Bible up or something. There's just too many passages, right? That tells us spiritual promptings are a way that God leads us from the inside of us. And spiritual promptings can take on many, many forms. You can call them the inner voice. You can call them a thought that is not your own. You can say it's an impression that you feel. It's a hunch, it's an urge, it's an unction. You can say it's a sense of peace or freedom when you make a decision. You can say it's a dream that you had. You can say it's a vision that you saw. You can call it spiritual revelation. You have all these different forms that spiritual promptings can take. And all these are ways in which the Holy Spirit, which is God with us, leads us and prompts us in navigating the will of God for our life. Now, most of the time, when a church leader or uh, just a Christian says something like, I heard God speak to me. Most of the time when they say that, they are not referring to an audible voice from heaven. God really actually speaks audibly. It does happen, but very, very rare. Most of the time when you hear a Christian say that, or you attend a seminar that is something like hearing the voice of God or something like that, they are really referring to this. They are referring to listening, discerning spiritual promptings, the, the still, small, quiet voice of God, the voice in your heart, the feeling that you have, the impression. Uh, we believe in a supernatural God, and so we believe in a supernatural God, and spiritual promptings are a reality, but it also means it's kind of unexplainable in the way that God leads us. And learning how to discern spiritual promptings it's a bit of a process because it requires you to get familiar with something that's not natural. Spiritual problems are not natural. It's not of this world. And it's really hard to teach. In fact, it's impossible. Uh, the best I can do is I can describe it to you, I can tell you my experiences being guided by the Spirit's promptings, but really to know it, you have to experience it for yourself. Uh, my aim really is to help you open your eyes to see that this is a way that God leads us so that you know it's possible, so that you're open to God if He decides to lead you this way and you won't just dismiss it as your imagination or as you eating something wrong last night. <laughs> <laughs>
yes. <laughs> when I went to, we were looking for our home to stay in. Uh, this was one way that we decided to buy the house that we're currently staying in. I visited many different places before that, uh, but when we came to this place, which is now our house, both of us felt a sense of peace, a sense of freedom to make the choice to buy the place. And it, this sense of freedom was not present when we went to visit other places, right? But we got to this place and we felt this liberty. Uh, and it wasn't just because of the place either. It was not nicely furnished. It was kind of dark. The lights were not turned on. I don't know why they would have shown they not turned on the lights. Uh, it was not even a Christian house, but both of us felt peace in our hearts. And so that was the guiding hand of God and we decided God has indicated this to us as an option that we can choose and so we decided that this was the place that we were going to buy and make our home. It was the way that He led us. Um, I sometimes get the weekly message through spiritual promptings. I could be out on a run doing something else and then out of the blue I hear an inner voice in my heart says something like, the kingdom. And it comes out of nowhere. And when that happens, I know instantly, okay, I have the seed for the week mess or the week's message. And then I will take that seed and go and study it and see what, what God reveals. But I sometimes get messages that way. If you know Anne, you would know that she is led and guided by God a lot through spiritual promptings. Right? She will sometimes feel like she just needs to do something. She will sometimes feel like she just needs to go somewhere. And then when that happens, she will tell me, I just feel that I must do it. Isn't it weird? Isn't it weird that I feel like I have to go and do this? And I'm so used to it right now, I just say, no, it's not weird at all. Right? In fact, with you, it's quite common. And so just go and do it. You don't need to explain yourself. Because that's the way that God has led her and still continues to lead her uh, through these functions, through these impressions, through these feelings. My hope is that as all of you are doing your daily Bible reading, that you are also learning how to discern the Spirit's prompting for yourself. Because one of the tasks that you need to do as you study God's Word is that you need to highlight a passage out of the day's reading that speaks to you. And I don't know if this is your experience or uh, you feel the same way, but sometimes don't you find that when you read that passage, there are certain verses that pop out more Certain verses that seem to call out to you. Certain verses that seem to just draw your attention in. That's because it's the Spirit's prompting. The Holy Spirit, who is your teacher, is trying to prompt you to focus on something so that He can explain and teach something to you. And you can take it as a revelation or a teaching from Him for your own life. The cool thing is, when you start to familiarize yourself with the Spirit's prompting as you read the Bible, then you're also learning how to recognize the Spirit's prompting outside of the Bible in your daily life. Because the experience is transferable. It is the same Holy Spirit leading you in God's Word. It's the same Holy Spirit that leads you in life. So right, if you are navigating the mysteries of God's call for your life, you have to ask questions. You have to ask, is my decision motivated by God's conviction? Is God leading me through my conscience? Is God leading me through my passions, my desires, my burdens? Is God leading me through spiritual promptings? And those are ways that God leads us from the inside of us. And it's important that we pay attention to those convictions. But there's one more thing that we need to keep in mind when it comes to God's convictions. Uh, Philippians chapter 1 verse 9 to 10 Paul writes and he says this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in the knowledge and depth of insight so that you might be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ meaning you have to check your convictions first does it go against the word of God second does it match up with the character of Christ but then you also have to ask, what are my motivations? What motivates your conscience? What's motivating your passions, your desires, your burdens? 
Are you sure that the promptings that you, you feel are really from the Holy Spirit? Because the thing about what's inside is that it cannot be seen. Which means it's very easy to make the mistake that our thoughts are God's thoughts. Or our passions are God's passions. Or our desires is God's desire. And our feelings are God's promptings. And if you're not careful, then you can mislead yourself. You can mislead yourself into thinking, this is the person that God is telling me to get married to. When really it's just what you want. Or you can get the mistake that God is calling you to be a missionary during the altar call when really all you want is the attention that people give you and there is nice soothing music playing in the background that beckons you. You can mistake and think that God has shown you a vision when really it's just a hallucination because you stayed up too late talking to your friend last night. You have to check your convictions. You have to make sure it's from God. You have to make sure it's not from yourself. Are you doing something because you love God and you love people and you want to bless them? Or really is it all about you and yourself and your own desires? So we have to be careful. If you're not clear, just take some time, pray, consult with others, which we'll get to next week. Make sure whatever convictions that you hold is really from God. When Anne and I first decided to come out and start TJC and Emergence, it was not an easy decision to make. Right? There are lots of implications in doing something like that. It can be easily viewed from the wrong angle, especially when people don't know the full story and they can just imagine any kind of thing that they want. We're not really concerned about people's opinions, uh, but we were concerned about our motives, about making this choice. And so we really spent a lot of time examining our own convictions, examining our motivations, making sure that we were in the right place in our hearts. Uh, we had to ask ourselves, why are we choosing to do this? Right? Are we doing this for ourselves because we have ambitions or because we have uh, a desire to, to do something for God? Or do we really believe that this choice that we're making is what's best for everyone that God has entrusted to us? And in the long run, it's going to benefit each and every one of us to do this. And we have to check our convictions. In the end, we made our choice with a clear conscience, knowing what we're doing was necessary and needed to be done, uh, believing that everyone would ultimately benefit, trusting that this is the way that God has led us and is leading us and even though it's not the best choice or easiest choice to make we believe it's the one that God has led us to so you have to check your convictions make sure whatever you feel convicted to do it's out of a love for God it's out of a love for people so that's the message for today answering the call of God means living in the mysteries of God's will. One way that God leads you in navigating the mysteries of His will is from the inside of you, through the convictions that He places in your heart. He leads you through your conscience. Make sure you don't violate your conscience. Make sure you don't do something that you're not comfortable with doing. He leads us through your passions, your burdens, and your desires. Right, sometimes the thing that you are burdened about and passionate about to do for God is part of God's call for your life. And you should have the liberty to explore those options. Don't ignore them. Finally, He leads us through the Spirit's promptings. The Holy Spirit is personal. He's in your life. He's leading you. He's guiding you. He will prompt you. But you have to learn how to discern His promptings. And that can only come with time spent with Him, getting to know Him, being in His presence, learning how to hear His voice. So God is leading you, leads you from the inside, leads you through godly convictions.